mighty with us. Come on, let's lift praises to King Jesus tonight. We have joy because of what he's done, amen. Let's give our best to him. We sing it out together. We worship. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who ever more will be. He opened the prison doors. He partied the raging sea. My God, He holds a victory. Every voice we sing it out. This joy in the house of the Lord. This joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shine your praise. This joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place.
sing this out. Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? No one. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? overcome. You may be seated at this time. Be 
Welcome to church, everybody, on this Good Friday service. We are so glad that you're here. Hopefully, as you walked in tonight, you received two things, a copy of tonight's worship guide, which has sermon notes on one side and then a prayer list on the other, and then a communion cup. If you did not get either of these two things, would you just raise your hand in the air, and we'll have a couple people walking around. Man, ushers at the doors, you guys did a great job. You didn't let anybody through. Oh, except for one right here down front. Just one. That's all right. If you are uh, new or a guest, we want to welcome you as well. And if you're joining us online, uh, we want to welcome you. And those sermon notes can be found in the link right below the video. We also want to invite you back this Sunday. We have two special services for uh, Eastern, 9 a.m. and uh, 11 a.m. And we've been asking you to do three, three things. Pray, invite, and celebrate. Pray for the services. Pray for the people here. Here's another thing. Pray for Pastor Tom. Pray for Pastor Craig and the band. And those are... We're going to be working with the kids and, and serving. Pray for uh, everything that goes on here uh, on Sunday. You still have time to invite. There are still invitation cards at all the exits as you leave today. And come celebrate with us uh, as we celebrate our risen Savior. Can you do those three things with us? Amen. We're going to continue to worship in just a second. But why don't we stand to our feet, step across the aisles, and greet those around you. And when you're done, remain standing as we continue to sing. Thanks for being here tonight. Make your way back to your seats. Let's continue in worship tonight. Remembering what our God has done for us on Calvary's cross. We sing together, I cast my mind. I cast my mind to Calvary with Jesus' blood and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. 
up together, oh praise the name. worshiping you may be seated again at this time Changing 
everything He took my sin and shame away Now every song I sing will be for Him Ever since the moment He walked in Then Christ came And I was searching for a reason To believe that I could ever really Desperate for my soul to find its Savior Who I need a Savior Then Christ came Changing everything He took my sin and shame away Now every song I sing will be for Him Ever since the moment He walked in Good evening, church. My podium's on its way. Thank you, Stu. Appreciate that. I was on my way to get it. He said, don't you dare, Pastor. <laughs> Welcome to Good Friday. I'm, I'm glad I'm here because of the music. Amen, everybody. Give him a shout of <laughs> praise. Wow. Sitting over there crying like a baby. My tissues are already used up. So I'm going to have to keep it calm. Let's uh, join our hands and hearts together and welcome everybody that's watching online. We're glad you're along for the ride. I, I want to look at the camera and give a special shout out to Dave and Jane Pierce over in Canada. He has been in and out of the hospital for months now. On Wednesday, he went back in. We love you, brother. We're praying for you. Amen, church. So put Dave at the top of your prayer list. He needs a lot of help. And uh, of course, tonight, if you're not in this room and you're over in the kids' room, they're having more fun than us. Uh, they're, they're doing the, the Easter egg, and that's, that's just to get them enough candy to get, get all the way to Halloween. That's all that is. And uh, so we're going to help that along, uh, not only tonight, but both services on Sunday. Invite people to come either to 9 or 11. We added a service to make plenty of room for everybody, okay? So invite people, and we're glad uh, that you're going to go along and be here to be a blessing to so many because our world needs Jesus. Amen? So we've been doing our Easter series, and it culminates tonight and Sunday. 
I'm excited about it, and I promise not to preach any more than two hours tonight or Sunday. We've been doing a series on who Jesus is because in the world we live in, it's so filled with what is known as relativism. In other words, uh, people say things like uh, you have like world religions that say, oh, we, we believe in Jesus. You know, we uh, basically say we believe in his existence, that he really existed. But that doesn't mean they believe what Jesus said about himself or what God says about who Jesus is. And so that's why we've been doing this series, so that we, his followers, know exactly who we're following, his character, his identity. And we started out this, this series with Jesus is the Son of God. And what that means as God's only Son is that he was the only one that could announce the new birth and provide the ability to be born again. Amen, everybody? And then the second series message was that Jesus was the Son of Man, the duality of Christ, that the hypostatic union. We learned some fancy words that day that he was 100% God, 100% man at the same time. He had to come into this human form to pay for the sins of those in human form. And that's what he accomplished, yet without sin. And that was followed up by Jesus being the great I am. He was preexistent, and he will live forever tonight as we look at his uh, crucifixion because Good Friday celebrates that. When he paid the price for our sin, we're going to see that what the events of today uh, that we celebrate today, I'm sorry, that Jesus lived through with the disciples in the upper room and going to the garden and then, the, you know, his trial and then his crucifixion. None of it not only was by accident, Jesus himself arranged every single detail of that before this world was formed. He is the master designer of this thing called the plan of redemption. And before he formed this world, he and the Father and the Holy Spirit decided that Christ would be sin's payment. He would be the redeemer of mankind. Can I get an amen? amen? So what does that mean? He's the great I am. The God that always was, the God that always will be. Then last week we looked at him being the Lamb of God, that he was the fit sacrifice for us. Tonight we're going to look at a, a real, and I, I've, I've We've been leading up to these because these are going to be, you know, we're, we're swinging for the fences on these, okay? To use a, a, a sporting term. Jesus is Lord of all. And Jesus is Lord of all. And today's, if you look at your notes, in the title of today's lesson, Jesus is Lord of all, it encapsulates the central subject of all of Scripture. He just, Jesus just wasn't is and by being the Savior, yes, he became the Redeemer and sends payment. But in all these things, Jesus is God. Jesus, it reveals that he alone is Lord, is master of the universe. Okay? This is really important to us. Because a lot of people, let's just put it this way. A lot of people that are sitting in church this weekend, Good Friday or Easter service or you know, at, at some time, maybe they hit church a couple times a year. You know what? If you say, well, you could summarize how they look at Jesus like this. They're glad Jesus is in the car on the ride of their life. They're glad he's in the car. Who wouldn't want Jesus in the car? Right? He's in the car. Well, what we're going to find out tonight, Jesus doesn't want to be just in the car. In fact, the theme of today's message is life is best when Jesus is in the driver's seat of the car of your life. So we're glad to have him in the back seat telling us, hey, you might, you might want to turn right here because there's a big accident up there. We treat Jesus like a GPS system that has satellite connection. He's much more than that. So what we're going to talk about is what it looks like for us when Jesus is our Lord. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul basically contrasts what it means to be filled with this world, 
versus filled with God. He says in verse 15, pay, pay careful attention then how you walk, to how you walk, how you live. And earlier in this letter, he, he said life is a walk. It's one step at a time, one choice at a time, one decision at a time. And he said be careful how you make those decisions, how you walk through this life, not as unwise people but as wise. Make the most of the time because it's limited, because the days we live in are evil. I don't have to convince you of that. Because we live in that, because we have a limited shelf life in this, and because the day and age that we live in, every age is evil, particularly so at, on the cusp of the return of Christ. So he says, don't be foolish, but instead understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, don't waste yourself anesthetizing and numbing yourself to the crazy world we live in. Instead, because that leads to reckless action, but instead, just like when you consume alcohol, it, it takes control. You consume enough, it takes control of your decisions, your, your thoughts, and your actions. He said, contrast that with being what? Filled with the Spirit. He says, but be filled with the Spirit. The original language there be, means simply this, be under the control of God's Spirit. Instead of me being in the driver's seat of my life, having hold of the steering wheel, and God reaches out and slapping his head going, don't do that. He's in the driver's seat. And we're completely confident on the direction he's taking our life and what he's going to do with it. That's what it means for Jesus to be our Lord. This is played out in what we celebrate tonight. It began in the upper room where Jesus, and at, at the end of the evening, and I think I left my communion cup over there because I don't see it here. Um, I'll, uh, yeah, you can bring it up. Thank you, honey. This is my wife, everybody. Okay. Yeah. I just got distracted, right? So the disciples are in the upper room with Christ, and he's instituting the Lord's Supper, communion. And they, they, he, does, he says when he does this, when he breaks the bread, pass the cup, he says, you don't, you're not going to really grasp this, but when you remember what I do, did for you, and he's looking to the next day when he dies on the cross, and then the Sunday when he rises from the dead. When you remember what I did in order to save you, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And so that's, that's why we said that he instituted this. But in the upper room, remember, there were other conversations going on besides the last conversation they had was not about Jesus being Lord. That, that was not on the disciples' radar, was it? They were talking about what? They were talking about who was going to be on his right hand and left. They were talking about him taking over Rome, you know, kicking the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin to the curb. And they were like, we, we want to rule with you. And in the midst of those arguments that they were having within themselves, remember he washed their feet, humbled himself because they wouldn't wash each other's feet. And then he ruined the evening as they're eating the Passover dinner. He ruins the night when he says, by the way, one of you, are, you're going to deny me. You're going to betray me. And they all start saying, who is it? He's like, well, it's one of you guys that are eating dinner with me tonight. And they all start saying, oh, it's not me, not me. Some of them said, is it me? The less confident. Peter said, it's these others, but it's not me. And he said, oh, you're, you're going to deny me tonight. And that was a whole other argument, right, that he, they had in the upper room. And then they're leaving the upper room, and he's going to the garden, which is Olive Grove, in the valley between the Mount of Olives and the city. And he's, he goes there, and he prays this prayer. But before they leave, they have this conversation. And in this conversation... He tells them, I'm leaving, but I want you to be comforted. Okay? I want you to be comforted because you're going to be persecuted. And they're like, we don't like this. And he goes, but you need to be glad for me because I'm going to my father. Okay? 
And he's telling them this, and their response to him is like, oh yeah, we believe. We're, we know, we believe. We know that you're the one that came from the Father and you're returning. We believe. Exactly what they said. And he said, you believe, huh? He said, you're going to be scattered. And you're going to deny me. And they didn't like hearing it. This is the last thing they, he said to his disciples when they left the upper room. And you're going to be in tribulation. But be at peace. And he ends with this. Because I have overcome this world. I don't know about you, but it didn't sound like a peaceful farewell message. You're going to be scattered. You're going to deny me. There's going to be tribulation. But be at peace. And right there in that passage, he tells them, the peace I give you, it's not like the peace that the world has. It's the kind of peace that the world can be going to hell in a handcart, but you can be at peace in your soul. That kind of peace. Not peace based on you getting the ex your expectation, the life fulfilled. He says, man, it's going to be rough. And so they leave. They walk down. He does the high priestly prayer. On the way down, they get to the garden. And he says, man, I'm going to war with the enemy. Stay up with me. And he's looking at the full cost of him being separated from the Father and drinking the cup full of the wrath of God on our behalf. And he's looking at forfeiting his righteousness and his holiness and exchanging it for being cursed and becoming sin. And it's repugnant to him. It's repulsive to him. It's all the other bad R words. He's like, I it's contrary to my nature to even look at this, and he's going to become it for us. And what are they doing? They're sleeping. He's at war with Satan and hell itself, and they're sleeping. And he makes it through, even though he bled out of his pores, sweat like blood. He made it through. He continued to surrender to his father's will. His body was, as the doctors say, it was in systemic shock because of the pressure he was under. I think it's one of those moments where his, his, his godness overtook his limited humanity and pushed his body through that moment. And then it says he gets up. It says, after these things, in John chapter 18, after these things, after he had said these things, he went out with his disciples, crossed the Kidron Valley. There was a garden. It was an olive grove. And he and his disciples went into it. Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. And so John doesn't tell you the battle that goes on. Luke and some of the other writers tell you the battle that's going on in the garden. But after that spiritual battle goes on, it says Judas now takes a company of soldiers, five to six hundred, we talked about this, on the great I am because we use this passage. Five to six hundred Roman soldiers plus the additional temple police from the chief priests and the Pharisees and came there. Look what they came with, lanterns, torches, and weapons. One of the other gospel writers, Jesus, when they showed up with all their weaponry, and he said, yeah, I've been in the temple every day. Why didn't you just come talk to me then? Right? They show up in the dead of night. They came with the lanterns, torches, weapons. And Jesus, knowing everything that was about to happen to him. Why did he know everything? Because he's the one that designed it and wrote the playbook for this night. He went out and said to them, instead of them having to look for him, he greets them, what's up, guys? Who are you looking for? 
No fear. It's his plan. Everything's right on time. So he went out and he said to them, who is it you're looking for? Well, Jesus and Nazarene, they answered. And then he said, I am. And Jesus told, told them Judas, who betrayed him, was also stand, standing with them. And when he told them, I am, they stepped back and fell to the ground. We went through that, the great I am. Then he asked them again after they came to and got back up on their feet, who, who is it you're looking for? Well, Jesus the Nazarene, they said, I told you, I am, Jesus replied. So if you're looking for me, let these other men go. He's referring to his disciples. And this was to fulfill the words that he said, I've lost n- I've, I have not lost one of those you have given me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest slave, and caught off his right ear. Can I tell you, he wasn't aiming for his ear. The slave's name was Malchus. And at that, Jesus said to Peter, Sheathe your sword. Now look at this. Am I not to drink the cup the Father has given me? Now here's a couple things we can take for them. So I'm going to go through them pretty quickly, but they're right there in your notes. Because I don't know about you, but the head of this section was when you feel over, outnumbered. I don't know about you, the world I live in, I feel a little outnumbered. Do you? I feel a little outnumbered in my world, and I know you do too. So when you're feeling outnumbered, like the disciples that night, (laughs) five to six hundred soldiers, and Peter's got a sword. (laughs) And when I dived once in Florida years ago, I was on a boat with a bunch of salty dogs. You know, some of the guys on this boat, they were, they were hunting fish to sell to restaurants. Other guys were grabbing lobsters. I was there to grab lobsters, but I only wanted six. They had wholesale license. You know, they, they did it for a living. They would grab as many as they could. So these guys start killing fish in the water. And you know, when, when a fish gets shot with a, a spear in the water, you know, Mr. Shark shows up. Because he wants, you know, they're lazy. They'd rather grab your fish than go get one on their own. And so a big shark showed up, and he was behind me, and the guy I was with saw him first, and he he tapped his tank, and I looked over at him, and he went like this and pointed right at me. And I'm like, I'm not a shark. (laughs) So it finally dawned on me, and I went, and right behind me was about a, 13-foot hammerhead that looked like the size of a school bus. Okay? Now, here's the, here's the funny part of the story. As soon as I saw him, I have a little dive knife. It has a blade on it about that big. I whipped it out like I was going to do something. <laughs> Look out, hammerhead. Needless to say, when we got back on the boat... That was the story he told all the he-men salty dogs on that boat. I went back diving on that boat two years later. I get on the boat, and they're like, hey, it's Shark Man. Show him your knife, baby. Never lived it down. That's Peter. I mean, the Lord of the universe is in control of this situation. And Peter says, no, he needs my sword. He needs my sword. And Jesus told Peter, I don't need your sword. Put it back in its sheath. Here's a couple things when you're feeling outnumbered. When you're feeling like the world is that big shark behind you. Number one, Jesus is never surprised. In the story we just said, they went looking to surprise him. He greeted them. He knew they were coming. There's nothing happening in your life that's a surprise to your Lord, Jesus. The next thing, Jesus is always in control. They didn't come to get him. He went out to meet them. He went out to meet them. Why? He was in control of this whole thing. This was his plan. They weren't doing this to Jesus. Jesus was at work in the whole thing. 
This was his plan to become the savior of the world. He told his disciples over and over again before this night, here's what's going to happen. They, remember, they said, hey, you, let's not go to Jerusalem. There's, there's a price on your head. He said, oh, no, no, no. This is the whole reason I came. You're not going to keep me from my hour. He called it my hour. This was his plan. This was his will. Also, Jesus has authority over our situations. When he said, I am, they fell back because he is in control. He has authority in every situation. He is still the great I am. But I also see immediately that Jesus is a consistent shepherd. All the pressure he was under to become sin's payment. And as soon as they show up, he identifies himself. He shepherds the men that have been following him. He said, this isn't about them. Let them go. Consistent shepherd. <laughs> I would like to see a politician put his constituents first once. You know, the, the people that pay the paycheck, but no, no, no. Why? Because Jesus isn't a politician. He's our Savior. He's also Lord. He's a consistent shepherd. Nothing in your life he can't guide you through. And last, Jesus was and is there by appointment. He said, are you going to think for a moment that I'm not going to drink the cup of my Father? That's what I came for. In Luke 22, the preceding verses, verse 49, and so when those around him saw what was going to happen, they asked him, Lord, should we strike with the sword? Then one of them struck the high priest's slave, cut off his ear. But Jesus responded, no more of this. And touching his ear, he healed him. Jesus didn't come to war with any human beings. He came to war with our arch enemy, sin, death, the grave, and Satan. That's who he came to defeat. He didn't come to defeat any people. He came to save all of humanity. A lot of historians believe that this gentleman that he put the ear back on became a devoted follower with, of Christ. I would. And why are you following him? He put my ear back on, brother. Can you do that? I ain't following you no more. I'm following the guy that could put my ear back on with just the touch of his hand. That's who I'm following. The question is, is Jesus your Lord? The disciples did exactly what Jesus said. As soon as he was arrested, falsely imprisoned, kangaroo court, Caiaphas' house, and again with Pontius Pilate, on the dead of night, violating all Jewish law. Even the Roman Pontius Pilate said, this is a mockery, come on, this guy's done nothing worthy of death. Didn't matter. It was God's plan. They found out that night what it means for Jesus to be your Lord. They found out, the disciples, that there were other forces in the driver's seat of their life and not Jesus Christ, but it wasn't over. The question we all have to answer each and every day of our life and the question that we will answer when we stand before God is if He is our Lord. Because there's a verse in Scripture that says there's going to be many that stand before Him. And he's going to, they're going to say, Lord, Lord. They're going to call him by name, Lord. We did this and we did that. And he's going to say, I, you're not coming into my heaven because I don't know you. I don't know you. So th it's really important because it's proof for us to know rightly that he is not just somebody that exists in our life, but he's our Lord. So a couple ways to figure out is Jesus our Lord. 
Number one, acknowledge his sovereignty over your life. Those are fancy theological words to mean, is Jesus the focal point of your life? When someone is in control, they become the focal point of your life. It's what you think about. Okay. In Philippians 2.9, Paul writes, For this reason God highly exalted him, gave him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Why? Because in heaven Jesus will be the focal point of the throne of God. And all the millions that gather before him are going to bow because he's the focal point. And it says that we're going to lay our crowns at his feet. We're going to sing songs about him. All heaven is going to rejoice. The angelic chorus is going to join us. And we're going to all proclaim Jesus is Lord of all. But let me tell you something. Those that don't believe in Jesus, they're going to bow and proclaim that he's Lord of all too. That's the scary part. Every knee, this verse says. Now look at what Paul says. Of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Those that have decided in this life, he's not going to be my Lord. I'm going to be in the driver's seat. One day they will bow before Jesus Christ and confess, you are Lord of all. Not because they believed it by faith, but because they're going to see it by sight. And they're going to confess that to judgment and condemnation. But if you confess that in this life, then when you stand before him in heaven, it will be to your delight, to everlasting joy and peace, to paradise. Right? Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He will be the focal point of all of humanity. It's when that matters. If you voluntarily by choice, do it in this life, you're set for all eternity. But if you wait till he, you're forced to do it at judgment. There's not going to be anybody like, I'm not, I'm not standing. I'm going to hell anyways. I'm not standing. No, it says every one of those people that denied him will bow and confess that he's Lord of all. That's what kind of power the Lord has. Wow. Better to confess now. Number two, trust in his control. If he's in your life, but maybe in the back seat or, the, or maybe modern day, he's in the driver's seat. Okay? I'm sorry, he's in the passenger seat up front, not in the driver's seat. Are you willing to give him the, the control of the direction of your life, where it goes, who you pick up? who you drop off, what your destination is. Are we in the driver's seat, and the Lord in the passenger seat, and we're telling him, hey, Lord, this is what I want. I want this, I want this, and I want this, and if you don't get that, then I'm not going to church anymore. You're, he is not your Lord. You're the master of your life. Trust in his control. Give him the steering wheel. Number three, surrender to his authority. Romans 10, 9, famous verses. Once again, the Apostle Paul, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, not just saying the words, what does your mouth say? Your mouth says words that your mind is thinking. When you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, but there's a humbling to say that to verbalize it for others to hear. And believe in your heart, there's where your will is. That's where your emotion is, your soul, where you make your decisions. So if you think it, and you say it, and you surrender to it, what? That God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For 
You see, one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So the Scripture is right in saying everyone who believes on Him will not be put to shame. When are they going to be put to shame? That big group that's going to confess Him Lord without any benefits from it. It's to their shame. They had a lifetime of opportunity. Number four, celebrate His Lordship. So what did the disciples do? They went underground. They started hiding behind locked doors. And like we already said, Jesus is the the ultimate shepherd, right? The perfect shepherd. His boys are his boys are hiding. They're scared. They, you know, their whole life has gone tipsy turvy, and it's like they didn't listen to him the last you know, three years. Much like us, we have God's word, and then a situation happens. We don't see come. Oh, well, where's God? Right? We just melt. Okay. So it says that he went after his disciples. John 20, verse 19, in the evening of that first day of the week, the, gathers, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because their fear of the Jews. So they, they still were behind that steering wheel. They're like, we don't see how to get out of this, man. We're in a ditch on the side of the road, and there's no getting out of this. And Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them, and he, he picked up right where he left up, peace to you. Everybody good? Yeah, we're good. We're, we're locked out. Are you? Yeah, we're great. But nobody said that. Because I think it was great relief for every one of them when he showed up. They were like, oh. It's true. You really are Lord of all. Wow. Thomas wasn't there that night. <laughs> so when they're like, man, we saw him. We saw him. He was there. He stood here. Oh, if I can't put my finger. This is a couple days later. If I can't put my fingers on the nail prints, but I, you know, I won't. And Thomas gets a hard time. I'm kind of a Thomas believer. How about you? I want to see some proof, baby. And God, he does He can give you all the proof you need if you give him a chance. He will overwhelm your life with proof that he is the Lord of all. Well, Thomas declares that to these guys. That Jesus walks through the wall and says, What's up, Thomas? I hear you want to put your hands here. And Thomas falls on his face, recognizing his foolishness of thinking that he can steer his life better than Christ. And and he says, oh, Master, oh, Lord. And here's here's what Jesus said. You fellows are blessed because you've seen But more blessed are those who haven't seen, yet believe. See? Like, show me! I can't. I can show you in the pages of Scripture. But you can't take my belief in Christ away from me. Why? Because of all the ways He has showed me over and over, week after week, for decades, that He's Lord of everything. That doesn't mean everything went the way I thought it was going to be. In fact, most times it doesn't end up the way I thought it would be. But it always ends up the way the Lord wants it to be. So it says, peace to you. And having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of any, 
They are forgiven them, and if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. That's why it's exciting this time of year, Christmas and Easter, because not it's, it's the foundations of the people that believe in this room, but the, there's this crazy world we live in, and they will actually come and hear the good news if we just invite them, show some interest in them, invite them, bring them. And when you show up Sunday, worship without fear of what they're thinking. I, I, I want to be with Christians that are unashamed that Jesus is their Lord and they're all in with Him. All in with Him. That's who can be world changers. These disciples went all in with Jesus. I mean, He became their Lord that night. And they became world changers. Those frightened disciples turned this world upside down for Jesus Christ. Why? Because they said, you sit in a driver's seat, Jesus. You take control. you got better plans for us than we have for ourselves. Now, why should we do all this? And before I give you that last blank, you have to, oh, it's on the screen already. <laughs> Dang. I was going to do a timing thing there. That's why you do it, because forgiveness is possible. This crazy evil world we live in that so desperately needs to be forgiven. We were in the doctor's office. I went, went in uh, this week for my yearly physical for my doctor to tell me what your doctor probably tells you, or maybe a lot of you, no, not yet, but you'll get there one day. You're getting older, thank you. Like I needed to come and let you tell me that. After we got, got done with the the physical, send you had one, I had one. We go to the same doctor and uh, walking out of the office and in rolled this gentleman and uh, he, had a, he had a suit and tie on, which is rare in today's world. And, and he was pushing his wife in a, in a wheelchair and I said, oh, look, honey, we're leaving just when the party showed up. They were probably in their 70s and he, he just looked at me and lit up and without hesitation grabbed the envelope out of his pocket and handed it to me. And my thought is, my immediate thought was, he's a Christian and it's Passion Week and he's on mission. And I looked at the envelope and had a little, little tape thing to it that says, do you know the truth? And I just read the outside of it. It had some papers inside. I didn't take the time to open it. And I said, I do know the truth. Jesus is my Savior and Lord. I said, how about you? And you know what he said? I'm working on it. Why? Because he's in a cult. It's called the Jehovah Witnesses. You know what they taught their people? That forgiveness is not possible. You have to earn it. If that were possible, how in the world could the disciples ever earn back what they did to our Savior when he needed them? The night of his arrest, trial, his crucifixion, they were nowhere to be seen. But why did he give the keys of the kingdom to those failures? Because forgiveness is possible. Jesus went to the cross and paid it all. Paid it all. It just grieved me that this elderly gentleman did not think Jesus was enough, that he had to help him along. Let me tell you, Jesus is enough. He is Lord of all. He paid for all your sin. And that's what he's telling their disciples. Tell the world the good news. Because forgiveness is possible if they'll just believe in me. Amen, everybody? Heads bowed and eyes closed. Before we take this cup, 
I want to make sure everybody's in God's family. How do I get in? We, if, if, if you were listening tonight, you get in by acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, confessing your sins, and believing with everything that you are in your mind, your heart, that he died for you and he rose from the dead. And he said, if you believe like that, you're saved. He will forgive you. You confess him as Lord. As Paul said, just confess him. Say, okay, Lord, I agree that you're exactly who you say you are. And just tell him something like that. Jesus, I believe that you're God. I believe you're the Lord of the whole universe. I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin and the sin of the whole world. And with confidence tonight, I ask you for forgiveness. With confidence, I believe that you're going to take care of it all because you're God and you're Lord of the universe. I surrender my life to you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Now, if you did that, if you made that decision online or if you made it in this room, there's a connection card in the ch- right underneath the chair in front of you. Please fill it out so that we can, you know, give us some information. We'll send you uh, information on how to, you know, take next steps. What, sh- what should I do next now that Jesus is my Lord? And, and we'll help you along. Come back uh, Sunday uh, for worship services and uh, come back to celebrate Jesus as your Lord. Uh, now that you confessed him. And he told everybody that believes in him to acknowledge him when we remember, and boy, we remembered what Jesus did for us tonight. Amen? So in the upper room that night when he instituted this, he took the bread and take that wafer out of the top of your cup. Those of you at home, whether you have crackers or bread, whatever you eat, take that because this does not become Jesus Christ. This is representative of him. It's a picture of him. Like all those pictures you got on your phone, it's not really the people, it's, a, it's an image of the people. This is a picture of what Jesus Christ did when he gave his body for us. But after the bread, he took the cup and he passed the cup and he said, This is the blood of a new covenant. And all those sacrificial lambs that we talked about, Jesus is the Lamb of God two messages ago, they didn't forgive any sins. But the one perfect Lamb of God from heaven, Jesus Christ, when he died, he paid for all the sin. And we believe that new covenant he fulfilled when he died on the cross and paid and drank the whole cup of his Father's wrath on our behalf. Amen, everybody? So you drink that cup as a new covenant. I'm glad I don't have to tell you tonight as we leave, go work on it. Because you know what I can tell you? There's no work to be done. Jesus rose from the dead to prove the work was complete on our behalf. Amen, everybody? So come Sunday morning ready to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. On your way out tonight, if you'd like to give, we appreciate your generosity. We are still waiting uh, on approval from uh, Brown Sound Township uh, on our building plans. We're basically waiting on, I think, the fire marshal. Uh, We got an email uh, from the head of the building department. And in his email to us, he said, Church and pastor, we are so excited for you to complete your building and be part of Brownstown. And then he said, you know, we're waiting, John, uh, you know, the fire chief to look at this and that. He gave me some details. And then he said, please tell your congregation to have a happy Easter. Isn't that, isn't that exciting? So uh, I don't know if my wife and I running into him at the grocery store Monday night had anything to do with that. But we ran into the grocery store. We're like, hey, we need to talk to you. And he was like, oh. So uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful event. So thank you for helping to make that happen through your faithful giving and tithes and offerings and your missions giving and 
of course, the building fund. Uh, it, it's, it's going well. And uh, they were over there doing some work and putting in headers and, and filling in some cement this week, just getting ready for the approval. So pray for all that. And uh, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of that. So thank you for the offering. Let's pray. Let's stand on our feet first. Let's pray for our, these offerings, whether you give by text, computer, or you can use an envelope in the seat right in front of you. Let's pray to, together. Father God, we, we worship you for the plan of redemption. And Jesus, we honor and, and glorify you tonight because you are the Lord of all. It was your plan. It was your life that you laid down. And it was your life that you gathered back up to prove that you can be trusted with everything in life. Lord, we surrender the control of our lives to you. Fill this church with your spirit and use us as a bright, shining light in our world. Thank you for these offerings. May it make an eternal difference in the lives it touches. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for your gifts tonight. out again then on the third at the break of dawn and on the third had break of dawn the son of heaven the son of heaven rose again won't shine the day and celebrating him tonight. We'd love to see you right back here Sunday morning to celebrate his resurrection. We'll see you then.